let's go back to uh, to the Hedia Klatu and set the stage for the solo career. So, what at what year? When does Klatu kind of officially the doors close? And are you still in contact with the other guys? Was there a falling out, or was it just a slowly ebbing away? Yeah, slowly ebbing away. I mean, uh, D left the band in early '82, and we soldiered on playing live for a few more months and realized that we just weren't getting anywhere. We did not have a record label, so we had no prospects of making another album. And uh, the gigs were becoming scarcer and scarcer. Um, it, was, it was almost like a novelty act, you know? Everybody had already come out and seen us and liked us, and it, it all went well, but <clears throat> we couldn't seem to bridge the gap between a 500-seat bar <clears throat> and a 2000 soft seater, um, you know, and we couldn't break into that realm and we just sort of gave up and threw in the towel in August of 82 and uh, everybody went their own way. Um, I actually quit the music business completely, not the business of making music, just the music business. I had had enough. I mean, five years ago, talking in 1982, when 1977, I was one of the Beatles and now I can't even get a record deal. I mean, right. <laughs> talk about being chewed up and spit out. So um, I went back to uh, um, my roofing. I had a roofing business throughout the CLA two years because we never played live. We didn't have a lot of income and it took three years to make the first album. So that was my fallback uh, situation, which most, most musicians need, by the way. And so I went back to that and uh, it was a, a great decision because we, you know, we um, started to have an income. Our two sons came along shortly after that. Anna and I got married. All the stuff you don't do when you're in a band, you know? <laughs> and so it was, it was really great. I never stopped writing, I never stopped recording. I just stopped having people tell me how to do it. And I just did it on my own and went back to the real world. And we got, we started traveling again and, you know, doing all those life things. It, it was the best decision I ever made was to leave the music business. And 15 years later in 1997, I, I, uh, I'm looking at this wealth of material and thinking, you know what, I should put out a record. And this, this fellow, um, Jamie Vernon in Toronto, he had a magazine called The Great White North. And he contacted me. He wanted to, me, he was trying to goad me into putting out a, a Klaatu best of or a rarities collection or something. And I said, well, you know what? It's probably not a bad idea, but I'm in the middle of putting out my first solo album, so I'm a little busy. Well, he got all excited and wanted to help me, and he had a record label, Bullseye Records, and and right. so he helped me get this up and running, the first solo album, and, and then I released it in America with uh, Permanent Press Records. Ray Paul owned that label, and I went down to L.A., and uh, we did a couple of record store interview things, and and the highlight of all that was um, hanging out with Emmett Rhodes. Okay. Because well, I was a big fan of Emmett, loved his music, and I got to meet him and spend the afternoon with him, and uh, we had a great time. Lovely fellow. So it allowed you to uh, to get back uh, in the game, so to speak, but a different. The music industry had changed, I mean, night and day. Uh, grunge had shown up by the time uh, Klaatu had entered and gone, the whole punk movement had come and yeah. gone, and you guys are existing or coexisting as these movements are going, and I think just there is a sensibility of changing. I, I don't know why, because um, I'm going to turn it over to Michael now, but Michael was a huge Klaatu fan, and I know oh, Michael yeah. is one of those guys that would not have stopped purchasing your albums, because he's a prog guy. Prog seems to be off in a world of its own, and has such a unique following, a dedicated following in himself so bands like yes seem to survive but even they had a hard time uh but prior to uh, 90125 coming out oh yeah oh yeah michael hey, terry first of all it is an honor to meet you um 
you know, you have been one of the major icons in my life. And I just want to thank you for two thirds of my life of just wonderful music. You know what? Uh, I think it was through the Bullseye um, label that some of Clap 2 stuff finally was released. And it was right around that time that I finally got and heard of, for the very first time, Magenta Lane, if, if you can believe that. I spent years after, uh, you know, uh, uh, the endangered species, looking every time I walked into a record store, there it is, for the next Clap 2 album. You know, you guys were really put in a bad situation. Uh, out in California, getting any Clap 2 news was damn near impossible. And I wanted to ask you, uh, leading up to this album, the song Lost Within You, I notice that song out of all the songs on the album uh has a writing date of uh 1970 what was it 77 i think so yeah <clears throat> right was that ever a contention or a, a contender i should say for uh say sir army suit or endangered or magenta lane you know i um oddly enough i didn't really bother bringing my songs forward to John and Dee. They were both uh, major songwriters and I was yeah. still learning the craft. Uh, you, I was a drummer and I had to teach myself to play piano and guitar. Both John and Dee had grade eight piano from childhood. So they right. were well versed in the, in, in the world of music. And uh, I, was, uh, you know, I, I was a late bloomer. And so I never really thought of competing with them. You know, I brought a couple of songs forward here and there. Also on this new album, um, uh, I dug up a few Dusky Gems. The other one I found was Diamonds of the Mine, written in 76. Mm, okay, that, I didn't catch that, yeah. That song has, had not changed one iota from the day I wrote it and made the demo to what you finally wow. hear outside of the arrangement. I played right. with it many times over the years and did different things to it, but the basic chord structure, uh, <clears throat> the overall structure of the sand song, the blueprint, if you will, <clears throat> and the lyric were done, uh, uh, you know, 50 years ago. Wow. Um, and so that one's just been sitting there. And then the other one, for the few who couldn't be friends, was written in 78 during the making of Sir Army Suit. And wow. I never I never thought that song was anything particularly interesting. I actually wrote it for uh, Anwar Sadat and Menachem Begin during the, right. uh, the peace accord that they were trying to, Jimmy Carter was trying to get happening. And uh, I think it was Jimmy Carter, anyway, um, so I wrote it for those two gentlemen, hoping that they could be friends mm -hmm. and, and, and we could have some peace on earth. And so uh, while I was rooting around in the past, I found it and thought, you know what, let me dust this off and have a look. And so it made it onto the album, uh, partly because it was, uh, it was, uh, extremely topical still you know i noticed <clears throat> even with the very first track in you know in the beginning i love that track i said in my video i did a setup video for this over on my channel that i called it a drone it's not really a drone and in my editing i put down in the little info bar it's more like a staggered heartbeat to that very primal i i i love the whole setup and i love where you're going lyrically with this song, especially with the cut, I'm still trying to re remember how to pronounce the name, uh, a, a, a man almost lost to history. And I'm putting these cuts uh, together along with some other cuts that you've done for this album. And I see a common vein. It, is that purposeful on, on your part? Uh, I don't know if purposeful is the right word. Did I go out of my way to do that? No, not necessarily. That's what I do and who I am. Uh, these are the things that interest me. 
Uh, one of our sons moved to Turkey three or four years ago, and we visited him a number of times now and spent uh, a great deal of our time over there on adventures going from Roman ruin to Roman ruin. And uh, I've been fascinated even before that with Gobekli Tepe yes. and the younger mm -hmm. Trias of 12,000 years ago and the city of Cappadocia, which I haven't been to yet, nor have I been to Gobekli Tepe. It's way out in the uh, in the east end of, of Turkey near Syria. So I don't know if I, how close I want to get to that. But anyway, <laughs> but these things have fascinated me and I write about them. I was watching a show on uh, uh, some discovery channel or something about uh, great explorers of the earth and uh, of course Magellan's at the top of the list. And while I'm watching this show, I found out that he died in the Philippines and never did circumnavigate the earth. Right. The, uh, the captain of one of his five ships, Sebastiano Elcano, actually took over sailed the uh, um, uh, what's the ship called Victoria the the flagship he sailed it back to Spain after loading up with spices barely made it home with 18 of his men and uh, King Charles of Spain uh, granted him a coat of arms for his family and it says in the top in Latin first to encircle the globe because he didn't write a book he went back out on the road <laughs> on the sea and uh, and and uh, passed away somewhere who knows where uh, he just fell into uh, ignominy and uh, he, he back then instead of going on uh, Facebook or the internet you wrote a book about the things you did in life uh, and that's how your legacy came about and uh, he never did so he faded away from history but he is the first man to circumnavigate the earth. When I found out this, I was astonished and felt I had to share it with uh, with other people that like history the way I do. Yeah, your love of history is uh, paramount in, in this new release. Folks, uh, just in case you, you wonder, Clutch, it was the only thing Terry ever did. I love this uh, uh, card that they gave. Now, does, if anyone buys your CD, uh, Terry, will they get this card, or is this just something you gifted me? My friend Jamie Grant has been doing the videos for all the songs on my last five albums. God yes. bless him. And uh, I let him do whatever he wants. But when we were putting this package together, he helped me do the cover and design. He designed the cover with, with my input. Uh, my good friend Ted Jones of 50 years passed away uh, a year ago in March, year and a half ago, and uh, and, and I miss him terribly. He did all the Cla 2 covers and yeah. did the paintings for over half of my own releases. Yeah. Anyway, Jamie Grant has stepped into his shoes and helped me out with this. And he said during the, the pulling of this together, that uh, he said, well, let's do some swag. Let's do a poster and a, a postcard and, and a, some stickers and yeah. we'll send it out in a packet. I said, oh, come on, you know, people aren't even buying CDs. Never mind the, the crap. Oh, wait, no, uh, we still use stickers. Uh, this okay. one is yeah. way on my really? phone. So. <laughs> That's great. Isn't this fantastic? This is uh, so, so this well, comes with the new CD. Jamie sent me that, and I saw, oh, that's so cool. Swamp Manor Studios. Yeah. And it shows this frog in a spacesuit wearing headphones. In the yeah. Yeah. And Isn't I that thought, well, that's a great logo. It'll make a fun sticker. Yeah. And so he sort of talked me into it. And uh, I mean, I hearken back, and I remember fondly getting my Sgt. Pepper's album and taking out the cardboard cutout and uh, affixing the mustache because I couldn't grow one yet. Right. There's the poster. Yeah. You get a couple of stickers, a poster, and a postcard. And on the other side of the postcard is uh, all 20 solo releases that I have managed to. Yeah, this is uh, what I wanted to do. upon uh, the world. Yeah, I want to draw everybody's attention to this. So if you're thinking that uh, Clot 2 is the only thing Terry done, uh, here's a, uh, a wake up call. 20 albums. Uh, in the beginning is uh, Terry's 20th. Here you go. And uh, these, most of these are available. I, I think many of them, if not, I don't know how many are available, Terry. Uh, that are They're still. all available uh, digitally. 
Uh, but there's a couple that are out of print. Uh, the live album, for one, Terry in the Twilight Zone. I got coerced into doing that. I wasn't happy about it. I'm not a fan of live albums. I think the only live album I can actually say I really like is The Mothers at the Fillmore. Uh, that's a brilliant record. Frank yeah. Zappa, of course, could do live albums because he had the best musicians on earth with him. And he always uh, was entertaining. But generally speaking, most live albums are not great. You know, the, the songs are too fast and they're sloppy and ooh, I'm just not a fan. So, And then there's a couple of albums that I did I, in the mid, uh, about 10 years ago, uh, I decided not to make CDs. So when I offered the music for sale, when you, when you <coughs> ordered it, you received the postcard that told you about all the songs and all the players. And then all the information came on a USB guitar shape, the USB. And uh, so they were a little four gig USB stick shaped like a guitar. Yeah. And it had all the songs on it, as well as a digital booklet that I made and any videos that were done at the time for any of the songs. And uh, I thought it was a great idea, but you know, it just didn't catch on fire. So wow. I still have those uh, on my website. You can still order a USB stick and a postcard of Window on the World, Remarkable Women, and Once Upon a Memory. I still say that uh, the future is, uh, you know, multimedia uh, releases for bands. I, you know, it hasn't caught on. But it's got to someday, you know, yeah. uh, an offering of a little this, a little that, you know, that to me, that goes right along with the tradition uh, of the Moody Blues. Now, they didn't do exactly that, but they offered poetry and then they would offer this and offer that. It, it was almost like a multimedia approach. And I've always thought that. Uh, Terry, I was going to ask you, uh, you, you list the musicians who are on the album. Uh, which leaves a lot of room for uh, what they're not playing. How much are you on the album as uh, a musician? About ninety percent. Wow! I, I, I do all I the so. I do all the strings and the horns, and generally I do all the keyboards. I'm not that great a guitar player, although I do um, a lot of the songs. I I use guitar samples and play the guitar myself because I want it to put through a Leslie and by and you know and then and delay on it or whatever I, it's it, by the time I'm finished affecting the sound um, you don't notice the fact that it's uh, not a real guitar you know so I do right. a lot of those guitars myself and the acoustic guitars I do myself but also I use a sample and I can do the picking you know you have to when you when you're when you're playing any instrument and using samples, you have to play it the way that a, a real guitar player or drummer would play it. Right. You know? So when I do the drums, I make sure that the hi-hat stops when there's a drum fill. Otherwise, you got an octopus playing the drum kit and something's right. not right here. <laughs> you know? right. so it's important to, to, ca to capture uh, the performance of what a, a musician would really do, even though I'm cheating, you know, recording live drums is a nightmare. I remember we spent three days getting a drum sound for calling occupants. I will say in, in defense that it was worth it. Those drums sound fabulous. Right. They do. They really and, do. Yeah. And they, but, you know, sitting out there going thump, 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 tap, 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 tom, 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 uh, for three days is a little unnerving, you know. <laughs> yeah, uh, while we have a moment, I do want to give a big shout out to your friend, uh, Terry Charlotte, who brought you to my attention in the first place. Without Charlotte, there would be no Terry Draper with us today, on at least on this show. And I just want to give her a big shout out. And thanks, Char. Uh, I so appreciate you uh, providing this opportunity for the channel. Terry, like Michael said, I'm a fan as well. Let's uh, turn our attention a little bit more to the packaging. They come in this uh, great little uh, cover. One of the questions and one of the comments we put out today uh, from one of our folks said, uh, I've bought the um, latest uh, pre-order. They've gone and bought this album. 
from you, but they're saying uh, I'm. I would love to have this on vinyl. Terry, what are your thoughts mm -hmm. on uh, your own catalog coming to vinyl? There seems to be something a resurgence. I'm part of uh, a, a man is, is Michael Luce, uh, kind of association of record collecting people. And th is this why I collect the old records? I go and hunt them down, find them, add them to my collection. And of course, there's new vinyl as well. I'm a big fan of vinyl. Love vinyl. And uh, in the the all these years that I've been putting out music. Uh, I've only done one vinyl. I did a retrospective seven or eight years ago called In My Garden. And um, uh, it's a collection of my favorite flowers. That's why it's called In My Garden from my repertoire, plus a few new things that were popping up at the time. And my friend Ted Jones had this painting he called The Garden of Eden. And I called him up and I said, hey, Ted, I'm doing this retrospective. It's called In My Garden. Can I use your uh, Garden of Eden painting for it? He said, no, Drape, sorry. I said, what do you mean? What are you talking? No, you never refused me before. And he said, well, you know, I'll tell you what, it's not good enough. Give me 30 days and I'll do a, a new, uh, um, I'll, I'll paint you a new painting. And I have it home on my wall. It's three foot by three foot this glorious uh, in my garden painting. Very nice. Anyway, that was the only vinyl I did. And uh, there's two reasons. It's very expensive. When you only make a couple of hundred copies, they're like $10, $12 each to mm. manufacture. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, the other problem is that uh, my records are way too long. I've 13 songs. It's an hour of Terry every time I put out a CD. Won't fit on vinyl. I'd have to do a double vinyl. Mm -hmm. Who's going to pay for that? I think that's a very good point. I think if it's going to be in, once you hit that double album size, that's where it becomes a, a little problem. Untenable, yeah. And not only that, most people are listening to music on their phones or their computer as MP3s. Are yeah. you kidding me? I got. I spend all this time and work with a <laughs> microscope on this music, and then yeah. you, you reduce it down to an MP3, which is like twenty percent of the information that I put. Right, there is what you're getting. Um, that's <clears throat> that's an annoying. I got to tell you. So vinyl yeah. is the way to go, but it's it's just cost prohibitive. I was going to say, especially with your style on this particular album, it's a. It has a very orchestrational feel to it. Even if there's no orchestra that you're hearing at that moment, I, I think that's why I always loved Clat too. You guys always had, uh, uh, you know, uh, like George Martin telling the Beatles, you know, think orchestrationally or think symphonically. You guys always did that. And Terry, you're still doing it, man. You know I, I love this album. You know what it is, Michael? It's even without the orchestra, it's the way you put the music together. Uh, everything is intertwined, just like a symphony, even though it's bass, guitar, and drums, and piano, and organ, and all the sounds you're familiar with. It's the way the parts are put together. It's it's very structured. It's, yeah. okay, well, I'm doing this on the, on the drums. You do this on the bass. <clears throat> when we put it all together, it ends up being very symphonic. Unlike like American rock and roll, let's say, like Bruce Springsteen, everybody gets up and just goes at it and it sounds fabulous and they have a great time. But this is a, a much more symphonic, symphonically, it's orchestrated, even though right. it's, you know, you know, have you ever heard a band uh, in a bar play early Beatles songs? Oh, like, yeah. Any of them. And, and you know, I saw her standing there, or or uh, I want to hold your hand. It never sounds like the Beatles, right? And the reason <laughs> is that the two guitars, George and Paul, George and John, were heavily orchestrated. It, they were very conscious of what each other was doing, and they were playing off each other. And yes. you don't do that if you just strum the song and play it. It sounds like the song, but it doesn't sound like the Beatles. Oh, perfect example. Yeah, Absolutely yeah. perfect example. And uh, another thing with this album, Terry, uh, I love um, the, uh, uh, what, good Lord, the song. The song, I, I'm still remembering them right now. Uh, but uh, 
Uh, with Mr. Toad. All right, and you have the reprise. Oh, I'm so sorry, Terry. But, oh, you Lord. know, this is more than a nod to Clat 2, isn't it? Yeah, it is. Uh, there's a, a yes. song on, on uh, Magenta Lane called Mrs. Toad's Cookies. Yes. That, uh, that John wrote, and uh, I always love that song. And Me too. I remember Dee and I saying, you know what? Yeah, let's record that. That's too much fun, and it's for children. And I actually tried to get it on The Muppet Show. Uh, or, or or Sesame Street, uh, but I am I had <clears throat> I was unsuccessful. Anyway, um, I've all I like whimsy and uh, um, that, Kenneth, yeah. Kenneth Graham and Wind in the Willows has always been a, a close companion. I'm an avid reader and I've read the book more than a few times, and I read it to my kids when they were growing up. And it's just uh, and there's you know what I think when it comes right down to it, there's an affinity. I find between myself and the boisterous Mr. Toad. <laughs> and uh, yeah, and there's just something uh, about his nature. Um, <clears throat> it's like a, it's like holding up a mirror to tell the truth yeah. to some degree. And uh, so he reminds me very much of Ralph Cramden from The Honeymooners, that kind of character. And I identify with uh, with that. You know, you guys, I've called you guys the Gilbert and Sullivan of rock and roll. And, you know, th this is exactly what I'm talking about. It began with Sir Rugglesby, you know, yeah. and you never, ever lost. Of course, that was more done in the first person, but you would often go back to that kind of narrative in a second person in Clot 2 and you're doing it so well and then to reprise it like you've done on this album fantastic man i love that that's my uh that's my good friend uh brenda webb singing uh the yeah. female yes. part there uh, when we finally get to the end and sing wind uh -huh. in the willows Oh, um, that's her. She, she's marvelous. I want to talk about this song, All Aboard. It's my favorite song on the album. You used really? the word whimsy. Yeah, it's my favorite because it's whimsical. It. Listen, here's what I, I, I did in the preamble up to this thing. There's a few things I, I just want to add here. Uh, with a little bash and a little, little passion on my part, a little excitement, is because I'm so glad you mentioned Brenda's name. That was one of my questions. Who is that gorgeous voice, that female uh, mm -hmm. voice? It's a call and answer refrain. So uh, Terry's singing the, he goes all aboard. And then she was the wind in the willow. And her voice soars, ladies and gentlemen. And absolutely yes. soars. You got to hear that song. It's whimsical is exactly what I said to Sue. And for those that are skeptics, and a lot of people get skeptical about art rock, about progressive rock. I've said this so many times before. Progressive rock provides an invitation the hand is extended to you the audience and if you're willing to take that hand and go on this auditory adventure with terry and the musicians he's performing with you're in for one hell of a treat and yes. you're in for just a magical whimsical it just absolutely filled with uh, uh joie de vie in this thing i just love it but if you don't you lose you lose, kids. The invitation's there. Uh, take his hand, take Terry's hand figuratively, and embark on this journey. And when you do that, and when you put away, you know, oh, this is a kid's song or that kind of a thing. When you put that away, you can sit back. It becomes my favorite song. And I think in large part because of Brenda's call refrain that you do with her. And then when it comes back, and it's the hook, man. It's the hook in the song. It, I, it it's in my head. I was going through all the board. You and I were walking I'm around. Glad, you, glad you like it. <laughs> Harkening Go back ahead. to what Michael said and, and how he's trying to put a handle or a definition on the, the music that I make and that Klaatu made. Um, I, <laughs> I, I, I've been asked this question a million times. And uh, uh, years ago, I, I found the solution and I, uh, I coined a new term. I call the Klaatu music and what I do, I call it progressive pop. Perfect. Perfect. I love it. Exactly. I think that really describes I love it. It's orchestral. It's progressive more in its arrangement and its feel than the actual song. If you strip everything away, there's just a song sitting there, you know? Right. But it's the way it's arranged and presented 
Uh, I like to use a lot of sound effects. Uh, I think that really helps put the the listener in the zone, you know? My, my goal right. when I r- write a song and, and record it and create it, my goal is to have <clears throat> the music and the lyric telling the same story. Uh, I want you to know yes. what I'm singing about before I open my mouth. Of course, sound effects is the best way to do that, you know? If uh, 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 you get some outer space sounds and stuff going on, you know where we're going here, you know? Well, you've yeah. never done that in the past, Jerry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but hey, you know exactly what you're talking about right now. I'm thinking of the song Memory Lane, one of my favorite songs on the album. Really? Uh, the music and the lyrics are wonderful. They they match perfectly. Yeah, they really do. Uh and and I had the lyric first, of course. That's the way I always write. Um, I do sit down at the piano and tinker and come up with melodies and chord progressions. Invariably, they go into the wastebasket because they don't mean anything, you know. Sometimes they're okay and they'll get turned into something, but generally not. I, if I don't have the, the, the idea or a bit of lyric, uh, I don't really bother starting to write. Well, I love that. What I got from the song is that, you know, your your memories can be or are a reality unto yourself except that you are memorizing them there in the moment and the real so-called real world is around you and it calls into question reality itself you know uh, a couple of your songs on this album seem to do that well, you know, the memories are important, you know. Um, a few albums ago, I did a song called Now. And uh, it's about you know, seizing the moment, you know. Uh, living in the moment is so important. Uh, most people are looking back or looking forward. It's be here now, you know, r- right in the moment. And that song starts off with the lyric that says, let's make a memory. Let's make it now. Wow. Yeah, wise words, because uh, uh, my type of person, I'm cri- I'm, I'm uh, clinically, critically uh, nostalgic. I'm always looking back because I'm, I, you know, I love my Beatles and you, you Terry, and your music. And uh, just so you know, I was young. I was young once. I was so young. And, uh, you know, it, not a care in the world and with the world and all this uh, today, there's always uh, uh, things that we go back. Oh, man, it was a simpler time. But. I think that the, this happens with a, a number of people, and it's a good reminder for us to uh, enjoy what we have today. And we have, and lately, particularly Sue and I have been reflecting on how good life is. Uh, I'm 65 years young now, but uh, I was young once. But it, it's great, man. It's a, it's a grand adventure. Terry, how long did it take uh, for you to put this album together? Um, I, I guess, uh, I don't know, a year, I guess. I mean, the last album came out bread and circus you and i talked a year ago in december so it it's usually a, a year i for the last six or seven years i've been putting an album out every year except during covid i did two that year because i couldn't leave the <laughs> yeah. house <laughs> yeah <laughs> and there was lots to write about so uh yeah it takes about a year um and uh it, it's odd because i'm down here in florida for the winter and I do most of the creating down here. I have a little studio set up so I can do sketches and write the songs. And then I go home for the, the summer and plug all this into the big rig at home and get all the cool samples going and, and you know, reorchestrate everything, get it happening. And then do the vocals and invite my various friends to play some electric guitar and background vocals. And, and I spend the summer putting it all together. Uh, it's funny, I got back down here and I'd sent the master off for, for manufacture. And uh, it occurred to me that I hadn't written a song in three or four months. I'd been buried in the studio, finishing off the one you're holding in your hand. And I hadn't <laughs> written a new song in three or four months. And it, it happens every year. It's like, oh my God, has the muse left me? Is it gone? Oh, Am I yeah. dry? Yeah, and a week later, I've written two new songs. That's a logical extension of the next question. 
advice for songwriters or anybody that's ever wanted that say, oh, this seems like such a, an engaging thing. For you personally, is it, is it easy to write a song? Is it a difficult process to write a song? Does it come easily? Or are you one of the people that really has to fight for every lyric that gets out? Oh, uh, some it, it's always different. Some of them fall out, just like where did that come from? Others I struggle with, and I I have to make it work. I get a, a something comes along, and I I like it, and then trying to get everything else happening around it to make it to finish it becomes work. But generally, uh, it's it's a it's a wonderful process. And the thing I like about it is. Um, a lot of times when I'm writing a song, I have to actually stop and think how I feel about this subject in order to convey my feelings. I have to uh, look inward. And that's that's part of the process, you know? And that's, that's, that's an interesting thing. Uh, a few years ago, uh, the American Supreme Court passed a law protecting gay marriage and a good friend of mine, she posted on her Facebook page this giant heart uh, in a rainbow, and it said, love wins. And I saw that and I thought, my God, isn't that the truth? So I sat down and wrote this song called Love Wins. It appears on a few albums, so I don't remember which one. And uh, it was all about that, you know? And uh, I, I think I start off by saying, um, uh, I don't care who clothes who I don't care whose clothes you wear. I just want them to fit. And I don't care whose bed you share. Just close the door a bit. <laughs> <laughs> you know? And and here's the idea is that it doesn't matter where the love comes from. More love in the world, we win. Folks, uh, we're here to help promote this new album. It's the latest from Terry Draper. Uh, I'm holding a copy of it in my hand. You can help Terry out and help your ears out and your hearts out if you head over to terrydraper.com and order this thing up yourselves right now. Terry also has a presence on Bandcamp. I think you probably got a better deal if you go right direct uh, through Terry. The album is ready to go on Bandcamp, but okay. I haven't released it yet. Let me tell you how that works. Sure. Um, I'm with um, a, a, a distributor in America called MVD. And they have production dates and deadlines and all sorts of stuff. And so whenever I set it all up for them and give them the album, uh, the date is always, you know, a couple of months away. And so their street date for this new album is in a week and a half, January 12th. But what I do is I release it on my website on December 12th. I give myself a full month to promote the album and uh, get people to try to come to my website and buy a copy, because that's the only way you're gonna hear it. If you wanna wait and stream it, or buy it on Bandcamp or some other service like that, you gotta wait till January 12th. If you wanna hear mm -hmm. what I'm doing, it's only one way to do that. That's come to my website and buy a copy, an actual CD. I'm not a big fan of streaming. Uh, I let them do it because because I, 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 I don't know, I just think it's, what, what are the choices, you know? Yeah. Uh, but, you know, my, uh, my two children, my wife, all have these streaming services. One's got Spotify, the other one's got Apple. And it's like, you know, they pay $10 a month for this and have access to all the music in the world. Here's an interesting fact. <laughs> the guy that owns Spotify is a billionaire. He's got more money than Paul McCartney. Mm -hmm. What kind of a travesty <laughs> is that? Tell me about it. Yep, I hear you. You're I hear you. With Michael. <laughs> oh. Did I touch a no. button, Michael? Oh, <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, you know, Terry, first of all, uh, there's no money in streaming for the artists. Uh, artists have been screwed right and left, and they're getting more screwed all the time. I've covered this on my channel, but, I, you know, I've got to tell you, I'm just sitting here listening to you, and I'm 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 listening to me. To me, you're a legend, all right. And I'm listening to a rock legend who is still creating music, new music, consistently, all the time. Why, while, while clowns out there are touring for billions, 
and not one of them belonged in the band, you know, uh, that they were. Uh, it's a travesty, Terry. It really I'll tell is. You, Ever happened to me was quitting the music business in 1982 yeah. and uh, i have never stopped making music i love doing it. i put it out thank goodness i don't do it for the money i don't need the money uh, it's unimportant i do it because i have to